people, you have to have a commitment to a specific vision. Okay. If you can master one form of trading or investing, that's all you'll ever need. I'll say that again. If you can master one form of trading or investing, as long as it's scalable, you don't need anything else. Right. Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome. We have a two special guests on the show today. Uh, one face you've seen before. I am super excited to, to introduce these guys, uh, representing uh, an old conversation we had with Trader Genius, but they've changed the name uh, just to find a little uh, more uniqueness uh, to what they're bringing to the market. And I think, as you all saw in the previous episodes, what they offer as far as a solution uh, for traders is very unique. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit more about that. So I have Rob Yonkins and Stephen Wright. Stephen Wright is a co-founder, uh, again, that was Trader Genius, now it's Terra Sori. And Rob Yonkins, head coach, also uh, supports the community at the Discord. And uh, thank you guys for joining me here on the Trading and Ascension podcast. Thanks for having us. Pleasure, bro. Awesome. Awesome. Well, well I'm excited because I know you all have, have talked about some changes um, I often go back to the old conversations that we had, um, some of the demos that you displayed. Uh, we'll deep dive, but just in general, what are some of the, the big changes that have happened uh, since the last time we talked about a year ago with, uh, with the company? Yeah, Rob, you want going to bring me up to speed on what you guys talked about last time, and then I can do the update portion. For sure. Sure. Um, well, let's start on that by talking about what remains the same. The, the club is still founded on on three pillars. We've got uh, the, the technology for sure, which we showcased the last time uh, primarily was all the tools that we had to offer. And Stephen and our other co-founder, Alan, uh, with some help from uh, you know volunteers around the club like Satya, have been programming that for a, a long time. Um, so that's, that's one of the cores. Uh, the next is education. That's where I come in. We talked a lot about coaching and mindset last time, Jason, yes. and, um, which is your bread and butter as well. Um, and community is the third super important pillar of what Territory offers to everybody. Um, we're a bunch of independent traders coming together uh, to share lessons learned and grow from past experiences so that not everybody has to pay the same amount of tuition uh, as we've talked about in the past. Yeah. Um, so those three remain constant. What has changed since we had our last uh, interview on your podcast is uh, how we're delivering uh, those three things. So a big key has been the pivot to Discord in a very organized uh, way to get our club out there uh, more accessible. Uh, Stephen's been working hard on the website as well. That's gone undergone an overhaul uh, as the technologies move towards Discord. Um, but yeah, a lot of these tools are simplified enough that you can use them from any platform, anywhere via Discord. In addition, we still have the desktop software uh, that a lot of us use, like myself this morning for, for day trading um, and trading our stocks and investments. Um, so that's that's probably one of the biggest changes we've, we've got is uh, moving, migrating everything over to Discord for accessibility and simplicity. Um, and I know my man, Steven, uh, has been working on simplicity for pretty much his whole life, but applied to trading and Terrasori, um, this is kind of the master stroke that he and Alan have been programming. Awesome. And so, Steven, I know you've, uh, the company, the, the group trading group itself has been around about 25 years, right? And, and so just kind of start with your involvement um, as the co-founder and then kind of take us there into some of the, uh, the updates that Rob mentioned. Okay, cool. So the back in 2013, I was getting out of the Marine Corps. And like a lot of people, I was trying to figure out what am I going to do next? How's this all work in the civilian world? And how, how does one navigate freedom to a certain extent? And uh, I was drawn to the market from an early age. Like this is this is stuff that I was doing in middle school, just had a natural attraction to it had a class on it. And all of a sudden, my dad helped me out a little bit along the way. And he actually made some of the practice trades that we were making. So it kind of seeded really early on, but I never really did anything with it. So when I got out of the Marine Corps, there's a process that you have to go through. And part of that process is uh, you're taking classes and you're being challenged by a lot of different people in a good way to ask you what's your plan. And 
part of that, uh, when you're talking to people that you respect or people that are senior to you, they try to give you as much help as they can on the way out. Hey, my cousin, my brother, my parents do this. Let me hook you up with, uh, just to have a conversation with them, that kind of thing. Yeah. Well, I ran into one of my buddies, uh, Grace and Ernst, and he was a captain. I was a lieutenant at the time, and he gave me this book called The Four Hour Work Week by Tim Ferriss. Okay, I heard of that. So we're building up to this ultimate launch to get back into civilian life. I'm living in Hawaii at the time, and that's like the dream for me, period. Um, so somehow ended up over there, got out, started going after it on my own, trading stocks. And was getting some good success at a time when pretty much everyone was getting good success. Yeah. And then <laughs> I I got nailed one time by Carl Icahn on Apple. I went to bed uh, with four thousand more dollars than I woke up with, and I oh, wow. it wasn't a huge position, but it was it was enough for me to go. There must be more to this than just sitting around and waiting for these really really rich market makers to just have some sort of uh, emotional calling that they need to do something for some reason. Right. And that impacts my finances. So I learned a lot there. I learned that I needed a method. I learned that I needed uh, education, specifically, specific education. And I just started reading books. I got like three books into it before I met uh, this guy named Alan. And it was by a, by a bunch of different people through paragliding and all this other stuff. But that stuff's not important. And uh, his introduction was, this guy makes 10% per trade. And I said, you're full of no <laughs> luck. I was like, right. There's no way he does. And he goes, he does it every day, multiple times a day. I go, okay, prove it. So they did. And he did. And then that was about 10 years ago. And he kind of uh, became my mentor for trading. This guy, his name's Alan. He's extremely smart, like measurably extremely smart. And he has a couple of uh, skills that when you combine them together, they become kind of unique in one individual. Okay. Uh, so that's trading computers. And basically his knowledge of systems, which is a kind of an interdisciplinary um, study. He, he has that just because he's so smart. He can put things together really quick. So that's where, that's where we connected because that's my specialty as well. Okay. All right. So fast forward, we start working together. He teaches me what, what he knows and I develop it into a curriculum that curriculum is called cornerstone, uh, and virtues of a master. So one side is you got more of the lifestyle mindset, that's virtues of a master. And then you okay. need a systematic way to train and uh, learn actually what's important in the market. That's cornerstone. And when you combine the two, that's where the magic really happens within our program. Uh, I helped him throughout that entire project uh, process, like design the program to facilitate systematic training. So it's a professional level tool, which we'll go through in a little bit. But the the short version of that is it has it has like world class tools for almost everything. And that's a problem in and of itself, because where do I go? What do I do? Because we just released another awesome tool. There's 300 other ones. Which one do you want to use? Like, I don't know where to start. Yeah, right. So that's right. So 10 years into it, just been designing that and, and really simplifying it as much as can do at the moment. And we just hit um, an evolutionary change in our trading technology, which we'll talk about later. So that's the whole, that's kind of the whole story from my end. And that's what we've been doing for about 10 years, he and I together. And uh, Rob joined about, what was it all like? Uh, six years now, seven years. You started about seven years ago. You took a little hiatus and then you came back, got back into it and you really committed. And that's where you started getting your, your results in your life and all that stuff. So about seven awesome. years ago. Awesome. So two, a few things that before we move forward that you, you mentioned that I took some notes here, I want to touch on. Um, I noticed that you said education, but then you kind of specified it as specific education. Um, 
uh, and I'm, I'm thinking you did that because there's a difference. Can you just talk about education versus specific education when it comes to training, uh, trading? Absolutely. And um, okay, that's a really great question. There is this assumption by people, and these these are professionals all the way down to hobbyists, doesn't matter, that there is uh, the more information you have, the better. Yeah, for that's sure. Not, that's not true. It's unbelievable. Like we can go through the the specific, an endless amount of specific examples of the people that have the most information, the most resources, insider information, the basically un, they cannot actually lose and how often they get it wrong. It's unbelievable. We've got a lot of stats. So where we started with the answer to your question is let's test what actually works. That's actually what our system is. It's a it's an R and D testing sandbox for us, and we go out there. Uh, this is what Alan started 25 years ago, and then we've been doing on uh, warp speed since I jumped on, just because we we really work together in that way. In addition to the team, Rob, uh, Satya, who's uh, technical with us, and it's it's basically a place where we test people's assumptions. So. We, we have specific training that yields specific uh, results and they're measurable. So uh, on, the, on the mindset side, you do need consistency. You do need to focus on the right things. You do need to remove certain things out of your life and you do need to measure certain things within your life. We know that sure. it's measurable. And when you have conversations with people that really don't have a clue what you're talking about, when you say that to them, they all agree. Everyone agrees. Like, yeah, that makes perfect sense. It is. It's measurable. On the trading side, what we do is we break it into layers. And these layers are, they correspond to a level of priority. Starting at the top, we have three different uh, categories. And then we have different subcategories within there. It's all, it all fits on, what is it, Rob? Two sheets of paper? Yeah, two sheets of paper. So sounds really complicated. It's not but it requires total focus and attention and practice ultimately. So we, we found out what are the most important things that one should know. As far as we can tell, we put them together in a systematic way to create a uh, very, very, we'll say like accurate and reproducible results. That's pretty much uh, what we've, what we've gotten to at this point. And it it develops a skill. Ultimately, we're talking about skill-based traders, which which is an excitement, exciting topic to talk about at this point. Yeah. And so uh, one other thing on that, and then I'll jump back to the the second question I have from your original statement. So when I'm I'm hearing, you know, the work that you did with uh, Alan, correct? with the mentor Alan. So your work, Alan's work, taking these expertise, taking this discipline, military experience, how do you, or what's the process? Because I think this is an important question in just the the mindset. It's kind of overarching, but how do you take these complex subjects, something that you have, have invested so much time into, how do you simplify it? How do you cut the fat? How do you make it to where it's not at genius level, it's for the layman, it's for these new traders with no experience. Uh, what's the process of making simplicity out of something that can be complex and so much data? With regard to making uh, dynamic things simple or yeah. bringing them into like a linear progression that we can kind of contain, uh, you you need what's called as a systems thinking. And this is a this is a discipline that is very, very foundational this is this is where i went back to school i went back to graduate school and got a degree in uh, sustainability basically and part of that is systems thinking you you need to understand that everything's connected basically yeah and that the sum of the parts of a system equal more than what the sum added up of those parts are just because the relationship are very very important so the that is something that I have totally committed my life to ever since I found out about there's this whole thing called it's like it, it it's like literally wizardry. That's the, to me, <laughs> like, oh, my gosh. And that's you'll see it uh, woven into every element of what we do. Uh, so how do we do it? It's it's not a matter of reverse engineering or making assumptions. It's about a, 
really boiling it down into um, behaviors, purposes, and intent. And then when you start there and, and you have the right information, so logic is useless without critical information, as we just talked about a minute ago. Right. When you when you do have that and it's testable and you can prove it and it's not just based off the skill set of one trader, then you can move to the next next level where you can design something very very elegant and purpose built. What do you think, Rob? Yeah, Rob. What are your thoughts on kind of that linear progression and simplicity there? Yes, simplicity uh, would be at the core, and, and Stephen uh, brought up that word elegance. Uh, so it's inherent in the design. So as as a user for the last eight years, six years, um, you know, really contiguously for me, uh, the simplicity of ups and downs, uh, being able to trade trends uh, using the software. Uh, Alan and Stephen did all the research, they did all the testing, and and they baked that into the the program. So there's really um, you know, especially in those years, the last, let's say five years, it's become by leaps and bounds simplifying. And, and Stephen talked about the newer tool. We'll get into that when we share screen here in a little bit uh, called the Quick Trader. Um, it is the ultimate in simplicity. But realistically, you know, I, I met Stephen in 2014 and started mentoring me in 2015. Um, it's always been in the practice. Uh, every, everything's always been about practice, practicing specific skills. And the more specific you can get, the more you can compartmentalize the information you have to take in, um, what's relevant, what's not, the simpler you can make a practice, like, like even something that is yeah. dynamic, uh, like day trading stock options. You can simplify it to the point where you only have a handful of things to really focus on, do them one at a time in a circular kind of scan, and just see either the conditions are met for a low-risk trade or they're not, and I'll just wait. Uh, if all those check boxes aren't checked, don't trade. That's that's at the heart of the cornerstone method. Um, yeah. So that that kind of uh, simplifying the practice and doing so in a simulated environment before you ever go and risk a single penny. I know you're big on mindset, Jason. Man, um, you know, did did you use paper trading or or a simulator uh, before yeah, you, you got to the live market? And what, what yeah. was the value of doing that? Yeah, well, for me, it was data um, only, and this kind of will lead to my next question, but it was data and being able to see something that I could prove over time either worked or didn't work. And we, we talked about it last time I was on here, treat trading as a business. That's at the core of it. Yeah. And your trade log is an essential part of your business. It's the books, of your business, it's the health of your business. Right. Um, so yeah, stay organized and keep in track. Uh, it takes it from just a aimless practice into something that can be as simple as, oh, well, that was a low risk trade. This is a high risk trade. Um, and then there's no more guesswork. It's, it's, it's as black and white as you can make it in a dynamic environment like the stock market. Yeah. So this will, will kind of be long winded, but you kind of alluded to this, Rob, and I want to give you guys kind of my perspective. I've, I've been in a, a few debates with traders, so this is kind of my experience, but uh, I'm open, right? I, I want to know what, what you guys think, because you have a lot more experience than me um, in this realm. Um, I believe that you have to have discipline before you can start dealing with psychology. If I wouldn't, like you mentioned, Rob, if I hadn't sim traded and got data that was consistent, I wouldn't have been able to make the adjustments and the tweaks. If I didn't take the same trade, uh, and even let's just say at a small level, if I didn't take the exact same trade 10 times, I wouldn't have the input to give me uh, something to view a consistent output. Um, I always talk about like a chemistry experiment. If I put in this amount of this chemical, this amount of this chemical, the next time, different amounts, the next time swirl it and just all the inputs different. I feel like the output is going to be different. So to sum that up, I think that we have to have discipline before you can deal with psychology. So from you guys, I want to know just your perspective on that and then merging cornerstone with the technology that you have because it's superior technology. So um, when you're identifying with new traders, is the issue um, with them using the cornerstone? Is it in their uh, the cornerstone and them not having an understanding there? Um, I know that's kind of long winded, but just to open it up, kind of on that topic for you guys. Send it. You know, as, as as a coach, I've been been a coach with uh, Trader Genius Terrasori for five plus years now. Um, it's it usually lies in the fact that. New traders, especially, or even experienced traders that have bad habits, aren't aware why they're clicking buy and clicking close when they actually are. 
Yeah. Um, so I don't, I don't know that you can separate discipline and uh, the psychology of trading because a lot of your, your actual discipline, discipline is a byproduct of making the right decisions and having your focus on the, the right place at the right time, not being distracted. Um, I, I think they go hand in hand, brother, uh, okay. because why you're entering a certain trade is, is both discipline and psychology all at once. Um, you know, Stephen taught me about focusing on basically associating the actions of today with the results of tomorrow in a, in a systems yeah, kind of sense. Tomorrow. I like that. Uh, yeah. And, and tomorrow can be tomorrow. If you're stock trading, it could be five seconds from now. If you're options day trading, right. Tomorrow is just a placeholder for present affecting future. Gotcha. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't know if you can separate the two out completely, Stephen. Oh man. There's layers to this one, Jason. <laughs> this is my, oh man. Yeah, I really like what Rob said there. And I, I think it's a fantastic topic. This is this is like the fundamental, what we do every day and why we do it. So let's just break it down into layer number one, discipline. So the, the problem with discipline is that it's a, um, it's a rear looking word. We, we replace that with commitment. So okay. the reason why uh, when it's waking up being disciplined is usually a word that we uh, associate with uh, like corrective action or parenting or some sort of authority figure getting into us because we did something that we shouldn't have or whatever it is. So this is not a critique on you at all, but this is in terms of how do we frame it so that right. people this can benefit people. You have to have a commitment to a specific vision. Okay. If you can master one form of trading or investing, that's all you'll ever need. I'll say that again. If you can master one form of trading or investing, as long as it's scalable, you don't need anything else. We talked back that's just a back real quick. We talked about uh, earlier information and uh, information becomes toxic at a certain point. And we'll get to that in a second. So okay. you, you bring something up that's a very, very, it's like a hot topic. Yeah, for sure. Uh, indicators. So you, you said you implied, correct me, jump in at any point in time. I'm just making okay. a sound here. You implied that you were, you were tr attempting to do the same thing, being disciplined, doing the same thing each time so you could measure it, correct? Correct, yeah. And in order to do that, you need to use uh, indicators, right? Uh, well, it, it works with price action as well. When I first started, it was, okay, this is the pattern. Um, the, the, despite what I'm seeing in the market, this is what I wrote down as my strategy. I'm going to do it 10 times, and then I'm going to look at the data. So indicators so, sometimes, but um, it can work with price action as well. So price action, uh, are you using like candle patterns? Um, at that time, yes. Okay. So I, I, I mean that when I say that, that's what I, I mean, all of that stuff. So you're looking for patterns that are established things that you can either read about or someone has some yeah. YouTube, you, something about, right? Gotcha. Yep. If you look at the amount of technology that was developed, like MACD, RSI, we can go down all the different traditional indicators, candlestick patterns, and you look at the history of how they were created, you'll find that almost all of them were created before computers were mainstream. Mm -hmm. So these were mathematicians writing stuff down in a market that was heavily, heavily affected by insider trading. I mean, we're talking about the, the market didn't even get regulated to a certain extent until fairly recently. Yeah. And now you have all these technical uh, computer-based models that are assuming that things like the RSI, MACD, the list goes on and on and on. We got a, you know, we got a bun a bunch of them there that they work. And what ends up happening is people like you and I, we make assumptions, and this is professionals as well. We have quite a few of them. No one ever actually tested those things. They just because they were there. They wrote books about them. They kept, they used them. Some of them worked. Sometimes it worked. Sometimes it didn't. We can go all deep, deep, deep dive here. So how do you validate what you're doing in your case? How you, you did a trade log and you said, all right, 
got X, let's say I'm at 80%. That worked. I'm at 40%. That didn't work. Well, we all know that there's macro and micro level, um, we'll just call them cycles within the market. Cycles, yeah. And the more computerized trading and algorithms get their hands on things, the more that they're going to cancel each other's effectiveness out, number one, but also create um, micro opportunities that the human can perceive. So, oh, we're trading in a range. That would be an example of one. Or there's a double top candlestick pattern or here it broke my trend line or it broke it broke uh, across the we got a crossover of the 50 and 200 whatever right. the traditional indicator we call them traditional because we develop all of our own stuff so just to be clear we're talking gotcha. about everything that's available yeah the kind so, of default ones right and so when you look at them and you start the next layer would what's the next rational layer if you test test rsi and you go this works 50 percent of the time What's the next le- rational thing to do? Um, probably take it to the real market. Take it to the real market and maybe sprinkle some MACD in there. Oh, yeah. Maybe add something on it to get a little more defined results. Yeah. Okay. So you test it again and you get uh, 60%. Did it work? Yeah. You know, it's. I guess it's hard to tell. I guess, yeah, what you added on, it got a higher percentage. So I guess that would be success. Yeah. And then, so how many trades typically would you, this is this is just to highlight the broader problem, not to single anything out, but we yeah. all do this, by the way. So you, you do 10 trades, 100, 1,000, 10,000. How many trades do you go to? You go, dang, this is working pretty good. Yeah, you know, personally, I would say 50, but I think the, the more data, the better. And how long, like within the time horizon, how long does it take for you to get that 50, just ballparking? Um, a ballpark would be um, maybe um, a couple weeks to a month. Perfect. All right. And then you're in paper when you're trading that, when you're testing? Yeah. Yep. That would be paper yeah, at that point. So we know that with our, with our um, indicators that when we look at micro and macro level trends, you get, generally speaking, uh, consistency uh, every about three weeks. This is, this is not. This is not a, um, oh, he said every three weeks is going to keep trending up or down. No, 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 no. What <laughs> we're talking about is usually things on a, on a bare minimum take about three weeks to develop. So what if, you're, what if you're testing your, your theory, whatever it is, you, anyone, you're using something that you think works and you get an 80% during that, that part of the macro level cycle that, yeah, that is cycle. the systemic reason why it works. Right. Will you know? No, definitely not. You will not know. We there's no way to know until you see it on a chart the next year because right. a new top, a new bottom, new supports, new resistances are all uh, established and formed, then we get the context of what we were doing back then. Gotcha. So if you if you can look through the lens of uh, one indicator, it's rational to think that more indicators are better. And the more people trade, the longer they trade, the more comp we never see people move towards simplicity ever. Over time, one decade to Rob, I want you to jump in here because we've had some uh, ex-professionals come to us. And what do their screens look like when you <laughs> when you say right before you say turn all of it off go take a breather and come back and we'll get started uh inundation of information um, yeah and and typically we start with how many screens you got is it is it like is it in double digits uh because that's just overloading you with more information than a human mind can process uh yeah. in a reasonable amount of time um, yeah, it's it's information overload, which causes decision fatigue and options paralysis. And it's like Ricky Bobby in that movie. He's like, he's getting interviewed. He doesn't know what to do with his hands. So he just, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that's, that's typically what you'll do. You'll, you'll either go gun, gung ho and say, F it, I'm going kamikaze in there. Or you go gun shy as, as Stephen has written about in the past. And you just, I don't know what to do. So uh, panic and just buy like that's that's where a lot of our traders get tripped up in trading. Yeah. The traders that come to us. So the 
this really highlights like the main part of this. You got a 50 50 chance either way, dude. Yeah. It's like going so up or down. Huh? There's a very big difference between what you're doing and what you think you're doing. Because remember, your mindset guy, where does meaning come from? Yeah, we, we give meaning to external things. So what we find is if it works for someone because they did it, we actually don't know exactly what they did because it's a human clicking that button, number right. one. And we don't know why they did it. But what, when do we assign meaning to it? That's what's more important. Mm, yeah, that makes sense. After the fact. After the fact. So yeah. you can see this is what we call in the military a self-licking ice cream cone. I'll let Rob <laughs> pull you on that one. <laughs> but we have to address this. And until you address, like we talked about earlier, like what's the purpose of me sitting in this chair looking at numbers going by at the speed of light, trying to do something consistent, to stay committed to my goal, man, this, there, there needs to be a total redesigned approach to actually solve that problem in a, in the modern era. Yeah. Yeah. And that makes a lot of sense. So it brings up another question and we'll kind of transition to the, the system here. Um, and, and correct me if I'm wrong here, the, the data that you all have goes back to the start of the market. Is that accurate? Uh, no, but we like, we got data that goes back to like 1900. Okay. Like the, the start of the market, like the beginning of the market was like these rednecks up in New York city throwing receipts at each other, like a chaos. <laughs> stuff. So we don't really, you know, we don't look to, we look at available data as far back as we can. And okay. we, got, we use several different sources. So. Gotcha. And so with, um, and I guess that leads to this question with that much amount of information, does that change how the system works over time? Um, there's, oh, we got another 10 years of information we've added in. And now we've had, you know, the pandemic and this information, uh, we have to change what we do. Or is it always the same with what you do because of how you apply the, the data in a simplistic manner using the system? Yeah, the data, the data is going to affect. Um, if you have a system that's based off of a relationship between technical indicators and then all of a sudden the data changes your your results are worthless okay it's simple we yeah. we don't do that until recently or the latest evolution of the the quick trader uh because we found systemic relationships with things so it doesn't actually the data can't change because it's about um like the opening price and the closing price Th those two things are like how can that change? It's like blockchain. Everyone's going off of the same information. We're in the modern era. That that won't change. That's just an example of uh, why ours works so well. What we do before this is we develop te technical indicators that what you're talking about meaning are are easy to determine what what it means. Like what does this mean? Green means up. Red means down. And if you're colorblind, we have a solution for that too. We actually, no kidding, uh, for about 10 years, had a blind day trader. Oh, wow. So all, we have prompts for keyboards that will read out to you what the indicators do okay. and all of that sort of stuff. So we we went through that, that layer about 10 years ago. And uh, yeah, so it, like there's there's... There's no more, none of the data will change our technology because we built it considering that first, if that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. We're lucky to have this super quant, basically, who understands wow. how to do that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And so I'll ask the question and then we we can dive into to actually seeing this because I think we're we're building up the anticipation um, from the perspective of just hearing go, no, do uh, go and no go. Um, and Rob, you can talk about this from a coaching perspective. And then Stephen, just as uh, developing this um, sounds like a kid can do that. Right. Red light, green light, the game we used to play. What are the hurdles that individuals run into? that stop them or the meaning that they give to doing that? And how did you develop that in a way that, that really makes it simple so it eliminates some of that? 
Yeah, typically the the noise, if you will, if you think about yeah. it, interpersonal communication is is all coming from between your ears, sometimes yeah. your environment. Um, mm-hmm. So when you when you trade, Jason, do you block out all audio cues? Do you do you wear those headphones when you when you trade? Uh, when I when I trade, no, no. You know, I used to trade with music. I've moved to silence. Uh, sometimes some some ambient or some binaural beats, but uh, I, I like to be pretty locked in with silence uh, as of recently. Silence. Uh, I like a little like fountain, little water trickle uh, yeah. noise happening around me, something calming. Um, but if you don't have that, if you have the inverse of that, like uh, construction happening, maybe uh, you know in the next apartment over, you're yeah. in for a different ride, and you're you're not necessarily going to be the same you making the same decisions depending on. The, the conditioning that led up to your trading time. So most of our day traders, for instance, in Terrasori, we're trading that opening hour and a half. That's what we practice for 930 to 11 Eastern. Okay. Um, if you had half a bottle of wine the night before, then you're not likely to be making the same decisions based on this, the exact same information. You're conditioned to make a different decision than you normally would. So consistency of habits as Stephen was talking about with virtues of a master, it's a lot of lifestyle design to make sure that the go, no go uh, decisions are in line with what you came there to do and that you're prepared. So preparation is a huge part of those go, no go staying as black and white as they need to be. Uh, And one of the the simplest things that I can give my students that I I learned from Stephen and and, uh, practiced along the way and, and baked into my process is most of the time you're saying no to a setup. Yeah. If you just say no more often than they say yes, you're probably going to stay out of trouble more times than not. Uh, because you know, uh, this is risk is inherent in the market. So if things aren't right, if they're not setting up right inside, outside, or on your indicators on the screen, just say no. Just let somebody else make a profit or take a loss on that one. Uh, and you can just sit back and observe. There's nothing wrong with observing uh because you know, my mantra is no bullets flying. When I'm day trading, there's yeah. there's no there's no pressure on me to make a decision. Right. I could always just lay off and and not take a swing on any given trade. Yeah. The let me go ahead and start sharing. Okay. We can talk about it, but ultimately, seeing it is the best. Yeah, for sure. This, this is an example. <laughs> Have you ever seen this chart before? I believe so. Yeah, and so okay. this is uh, just so everyone knows, we're looking at uh, looks like. Uh, data for about five years here? Uh, So each, you can go one year, you can go five years, and then we go all the way back to 1900, and you can check out the situation uh, as it pertains to...